Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar with our esteemed panel of healthcare chaplains titled Opening Up Chaplaincy Notes, Best Practices and Research Opportunities. I'm Andrew Dresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. The response to this webinar has been amazing. As of this morning, we had well over a thousand registrants. I just want to take a moment at the top to thank our two co-sponsors, the TC Chaplaincy Function Research Network and our good friends at the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. Uh, some housekeeping instructions from the top. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants for viewing, as well as being uploaded to our YouTube channel later this evening. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our guests and panelists by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel that's located at the side of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical audio or visual questions, kindly put those in the chat box and I'll get to them as soon as I can. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Jeannie Wurksa, Research Chaplain, Program Manager, and Clinical Ethicist with Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Jeannie? Hi, I'm hoping everybody can see and hear me. Yes? Hello, everybody. Oh, can't see you, Jeannie. I know. We can hear you, but not see you. Okay. So I apologize. I have lost connection through my computer, so I have had to go to my phone. I will try in a moment to get the computer back. Um, I can see all of you guys. I'm so sorry I'm in the background. Um, I'm hoping that. I can't see the slides though. Damn. Oh, here we go. Great. Welcome everyone to opening up chaplaincy notes, best practices and research opportunities. Um, if you could forward to the next slide. We are thrilled to have a this esteemed group of chaplains who will be presenting today. We've been collaborating, looking at best practices and we put best in parentheses or quotation marks because honestly, given the lack of evidence-based um, evidence -based research for documentation, we're not really sure what the best practices are. And we'll return to that question at the end of our webinar today when we look at opportunities for research. So thank you all for being with us today um, and to our speakers. Next slide, please. Uh, our format today will be divided into two sections. First, we will look at, again, kind of the background to the Cures Act, what best practices are for opening up chaplaincy notes, at least as far as we can tell from our discussions and from those who have been accessing this new format. Um, and then we'll open up for some discussion and uh, questions about that, so those practical implications. Then part two, about the last 15 minutes, we'll devote to exploring research opportunities. So please, again, submit your questions using the chat function. Next slide. The Cures Act. So let me just say, start off by saying, why do we document our care in the first place? Let's remind ourselves, right? We do it because we know that the spiritual dimension of human beings and our spiritual care is part of holistic care. It is part of promoting well-being and health. Um, second, we are needing to be accountable to those who pay us, to our team members who ask us to come and see our patients and families, um, and obviously um, to our profession itself and the value that we have. And then we hope, but again, we don't have a lot of a lot of research documenting this, that documentation in the medical record actually impacts care, improves the care that we provide, um, allows us to be better integrated into the medical team. Um, we hope, again, might lead people to think that they should invite us to a family meeting or a care conference because they know that we're involved in the care. And that we also share relevant pieces of information about who the patient is and how their religious or spiritual beliefs, practices, frameworks, impact, medical decision-making, coping, et cetera. Um, so again, while we um, are not, we don't have a lot of documentation to support that it makes a difference, 
we do routinely now document in the medical record. And we document for three audiences. Um, the first right now is for ourselves, right? If an on-call chaplain might be following up with a patient we've seen, we want them to know something about what has happened. Uh, next slide, please. Our second audience is our interprofessional team, right? So there we go, um, again. And then finally, last visual, we are now adding to that mix the patient who will have in real time access to our notes. Next slide. There we go. There she is, looming large, right? We've always had the patient kind of sitting on our shoulder, but now after April 5th, they will have access um, to what we write about them and how we actually structure our notes in the chart. Next slide, please. So the open notes movement has been going on for a while and we're fortunate today to have some chaplains who have already been um, had this implemented at their institution informing our talk today. Um, and the, the goal of open notes, the, the movement has been to say, you know, patients own their medical record. They've always had access to it, but it's been cumbersome to get it. You can only get it usually after you leave the hospital. You have to request it through medical records. You don't get the whole thing. So the movement um, has been uh, taken hold in our country and again led to the implementation of the Cures Act, which was supposed to go into effect in November, but because of the pandemic has gotten postponed. The results from um, the folks who have used this already are mixed. Um, there was great resistance to start off, as I imagine there are among all of you on the line today. But with time, what the researchers have found is that practice did not change to the degree that our clinicians feared. Um, patients found that they appreciated being included. Only a small percentage of patients actually read, have read their notes, even when they've been able to access them. And the area of care, understandably, that's proven to be most tricky is our mental health notes. Next slide, please. So the Cures Act, as I said, goes into effect on April 5th. What we know is that most, but not all, of our institutions will be implementing this. Um, and most, but again, not all, chaplain notes, documentation of any sort in the electronic medical record will now be accessible in real time to patients or their legal substitute decision maker, whoever has access to their medical record. Um, I'm going to refer you to the website for open notes for more details about the Cures Act, for the research that I just cited, um, and those resources will be made available to you, those links. Uh, so the Cures Act is a done deal, right? We've got to figure out how we are going to respond to it and write notes that are respectful and support um, good care, best practices for our patients. Next slide, please. What we know is that there will be some notes that will be completely excluded from the medical record. And I heard that a couple institutions are completely excluding chaplaincy notes. I'm not sure how that's happening, uh, but you should find out from your institution. Um, however, even if all of our notes are included, you do have the ability to block two sets of notes. Uh, click please, Andrew. The first would be the privacy exception. So if you have a law in your state, for example, that um, says you can't disclose HIV information, right? And somehow a medication list with HIV is in the chart and accessible to a patient's family member. The patient is now does not have capacity. So your actual documentation would violate a law. The second exception, which is more pertinent to us, uh, next click please, is the harm principle. So if you determine in consultation with your supervisors, with other colleagues, that documenting or sharing this specific entry with your patient would cause them to um, either cause harm to someone else or to themselves, there is a mechanism that will be instituted where you can block sharing that specific note. 
And again, it's supposed to be if it would cause physical harm, not just psychological harm. The two sometimes are connected, as we know. Next slide, please. So in thinking forward, I would like to encourage folks because our institutions, our organizations are um, have different uh, electronic platforms, how these platforms will appear will be different. We have different kinds of departments to, to think about the following steps. The first would be, click please, Andrew, um, to consult with your IT and compliance officers to find out what that mechanism will be, how you can block notes, will a chaplain notes be included in the open up, opening up notes movement. Next click, please. Then, we have done this at Northwestern um, in terms of ethics notes. We have actually reviewed some of our existing notes just with an eye to, okay, if the patient were to read this, um, what would their response be? Have we included um, information that would make the work that we do, the trust building that we do, the conflict resolution problematic? So should we in any way modify our notes? And mostly we have um, discovered that we probably would not modify um, we might unpack lay language a little bit, um, or unpack the ethics language for our patients. And then finally, my last suggestion, click please, Andrew, would be to develop discipline-specific guidelines. Um, so again, how um, are you in your department going to make decisions about language, about what's shared, about who charts and doesn't chart, um, who makes narrative notes, um, will that change as a result of opening up our notes to patients and their legal substitute decision makers? Those are all the recommendations I have at this point, but you'll garner many more, I believe, as our other panelists take over and talk about discipline-specific uh, recommendations for chaplains. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to turn the platform over to our other panelists. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to spend a little time as we're we're starting looking at what does it make what makes a chaplain note or chaplains in general um, different from other providers who are working in the hospital, and how do our notes really need to um, speak to that? And so the first thing is really we're bearers and conveyors of a story. We have this opportunity when we work with patients to listen and hear stories see how what is going on in their life beyond just their primary medical complaint impacts who they are and what's going on for them when they're in their healthcare setting, um, whatever that may be. Um, so we have an opportunity with our notes to demonstrate how a patient's emotional or spiritual concerns impact that overall plan of care. We're not just looking at their principal complaint. We're looking at this person, what's going on, how it connects, um, and we have, have this opportunity to demonstrate that and talk to them, not just for the care member, the team who's doing the primary care of this patient, but also for the patient if they're looking back at their experience, whether it be inpatient, whether it be in hospice, wherever it may be, um, this gives them an opportunity to really think through the conversation, look back and I reflect on it and, and have the opportunity to learn and continue to grow from it. Um, so, so as we think about that, you know, how do we write our notes both for the patient or their surrogate decision maker and for our care team? Um, we'd love to spend hours and hours talking about details of exactly how to do that. Um, but as Jeannie said, we don't have that, those details yet. And so this is going to be an opportunity to think of that at a little bit higher level of that. Um, I encourage you as your teams to continue this dialogue. Think about how this looks for your specific team. Um, is there an opportunity to have a template or something that is working for your system? Um, you know, we talk about narrative notes, having more ability to express these things in checkboxes. We know that checkboxes are a great way to collect data, but do they add to the story? And so those are things to be thinking about as your team uh, thinks about how to move forward with this open notes. So, you know, spiritual care notes can also help the patient remember what their strengths are that they're using to cope. Um, so rather than just focusing in on those, those negative things of, you know, that are, are making and weighing them down or the spiritual distress, but being able to help them remember through our writing 
what are the things they're helping them cope? Where are they finding strength? What are those sources that they have that they've expressed are resources for them that really help them cope in the time? Um, and you know, and it also talks about how the the our staff, our fellow colleagues, can really incorporate this into their plan of care. Um, so an example of this, you know, each of us have a story that really could speak to this. But one I think of is a, a lady who had chronic pain, was in the hospital, um, just unmanaged pain symptoms, and in her spiritual assessment, came to a point of realizing that her husband had died while she was in a nursing home and hadn't been able to attend the funeral, hadn't been able to spend time with her family to say goodbye. And that was exacerbating her physical pain. Um, and, and through documentation and dialogue with her care team, we're able to really speak to that, that suffering and that loss and that grief she's dealing with, and also put into our notes how she is finding ways to cope and process that in this time that lets her, you know, if, if this had happened after open notes were available, where her note could remind her looking back on it of the ways that she has things to draw on that support her in her grief as she's continuing to, to process through that moving forward. Uh, and next slide, I think I hand it over to Sarah now. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so when first thinking about open notes, um, I wondered how this might challenge or change our practice. And I know um, I'm a chaplain in palliative care. And so certainly within palliative care, we had questions about um, how this would affect our interactions with the primary team. We talk a lot about prognosis and goals of care. We wondered, would this make us want to chart less or chart differently? We hoped it wouldn't, but we, we wondered if it would encourage more kind of curbsiding. Um, and so those are sort of ongoing questions that we're still thinking about, and I think this will vary according to your setting. Um, but you know, this is a this is a picture of my team, and um, you know, this is a chance to think about how our patients see our roles as professional chaplains. You know, we are members of the patient care team with access to the EMR, the electronic medical record, and we document substantial information in the chart. So I'd ask, do you inform patients that you document in the EMR? And what would that be like for you if you don't do that? Um, one su suggestion for a script or kind of like an open notes elevator speech um, is as a member of your care team, I record notes from our visit in the medical record, just like nurses, doctors, social workers. Um, and it's an opportunity to share your concerns with the team and to highlight that your faith practice, your distress about your prognosis, your deep spiritual resources or whatever concerns you have are important to you. And so ultimately, this is an opportunity to clarify and reaffirm our role within the interprofessional team. We, like everyone else that's visiting, and many people who are visiting this patient, are documenting. Um, you know, and when I visit a patient, even before thinking about this, I would certainly say, um, you know, uh, I learned from my colleague, Dr. So-and-so, that your faith practice is important to you. And so they thought it would be good for me to come to you and, and see how you're doing and how I can support you. Um, you know, and then I and then I would follow up with the doctor anyways. So I'd like to think this is kind of a natural extension of that ongoing collaboration and communication that we're already doing. Um, next slide, please. And again, you know, how do patients perceive our role? Do patients and families see us as clergy from religious traditions um, or, you know, clinical hospital employees? Uh, do they see us as both? Um, and so how does this kind of maybe inherited concept of confessional confidentiality, how does that affect the way a patient might see us? Um, you know, we benefit from patient and family trust. And we all know that patients and families share information with us that they might not share with others. And so in a certain sense, you know, we have this opportunity to really think about how patients trust us, share information, and how you know, it, it, how, can so, I, I hear a little bit of feedback or something. Is is there, a, is there a strange mic thing happening? No? Okay. I sound okay, right? Can you give me a thumbs up? I, I, you can hear me okay? All right. Um, uh, you know, so it's interesting. It shouldn't change our practice about how we navigate confidentiality and trust, but it should cause us to kind of think more about how we convey that in a record, in the medical record. And, you know, and one perspective that arose from the dialogue we had as we prepared for this, um, it came from a, a European chaplain colleague um, who posited that patients suspect that everyone charts except the spiritual caregiver and the cleaning lady or cleaning man. It, it is no 
a coincidence that both function as persons with whom patients trust their life stories? You know, or does the patient's trust enhanced by an archaic layer of confessional confidentiality and a feeling of free space allow charting? So yes, I would say the answer is yes, it, it does allow charting, but it calls us to kind of look, uh, to take a harder look at how we do that. Um, and so this is um, an important conversation we can't decide today, but again, it's part of a greater conversation that we encourage you to have with your colleagues uh, within your teams. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so one thing that's really important to think about is how do patients, will patients recognize themselves in the visit you had in the note that you write? So we have to think about kind of our, our normative language that we use in spiritual care, kind of code language. You know, we, we all disciplines have those kind of buzzwords and things that we, um, that we use. So I would say that we had a kind of a good debate about do people say chaplain provided versus I provided versus kind of skipping the subject. Some of that I think is, is up to your local context, but we have a few handy suggestions, things like, you know, we would wanna avoid saying things like very religious, not religious, or or little uh, things like RC or SOS or F slash U. Instead, we wanna say follow up, we wanna say sacrament of the sick, we wanna say use our skills to, um, to really navigate what the patient is concerned about and connect that to our interventions and our plan of care. Um, and just an, as an aside, a kind of funny thing at the bottom, I wrote offered prayer, blessing ritual versus provided. At one point I was talking to my colleagues and they said, oh, I saw you offered prayer, but you didn't, um, but I guess they didn't want it. I said, oh no, I offered a prayer. To me, offered prayer meant I did the prayer, but to kind of anyone else outside our discipline, it meant that you said like, do you want a prayer? And they said, no. So. I recommend using an active verb such as provided. Um, next slide, please. So um, this, so there, there's a, a great article that we reference in our um, in our reference sheet that talks about how it has some good patient quotes. Um, we want patients to see themselves in our visit notes. Um, I had this quote um, from some mental health patients. My clinician sees me as a human being and I'm going through this stuff and he focuses on seeing my strengths. So when I review it, his chart, I go, you're getting better. You know, or patients, if patients are gonna have access to their medical records and clinicians need to focus on a strengths-based approach, it can be very disheartening for a mental health patient to see that even the clinicians don't have much hope for them. So this is really a place where we can say, um, you know, so-and-so, for example, Sandra and I discussed her relationship with God, which in the past was a significant source of strength for her. Her change in prognosis has raised new spiritual and existential questions about, quote, God's plans for her life. We will continue to engage these questions and concerns, drawing on our favorite scriptures and abiding belief in a loving God. Um, so we recommend using quotes here and there, uh, you know, not too many quotes, but enough so that um, you can just give kind of really good snapshot of maybe some key phrase that you heard, something that came from the patient. Um, again, John's faith is growing even as his cancer is getting worse and he appreciates having uninterrupted time in the morning to pray and watch online sermons. So again, like if, if you know, the nurse or the physician reads that, they might say, oh, okay, this is good. This is what he's doing in the morning when he keeps telling me to go away. But again, it's just communicating the patient's strengths, um, their hopes, any of those things that are really um, giving, him, giving them comfort and strength. Um, and I think also it's a chance to kind of show that we do more than just Kind of show up and be present but show some like real content and some some good resources for example you know the, the other day i shared the story of the prodigal son with a patient who was talking about feeling bad about being away from god and so um, a kind of little concrete example like that can be nice next slide please and so there's this this term collaborative documentation which i think is really great so it's this idea that you actually document together with the patient during the visit. Now, of course, this depends on your context. This has been something that's been thought about a lot and written about in mental health. Um, you know, so why not make documentation a useful part of the chaplaincy encounter? So to think about it this way, it's, it's a relational intervention, right? It can deepen and clarify the conversation about the patient's spiritual needs, strengths, the things that they're thinking about. And I think it really can increase the impact of your documentation. Um, I know like in my visits, there's a computer right there in the patient's room. The nurse is updating, you know, can look at the meds, can do this. I can document right there if, if needed. I don't always, because some of my patients have kind of different acuity levels and it's not like quite the right time 
time, but I would really encourage us to think about ways that we could do that together with the patient. And even if we can't type it exactly in the moment, we could certainly say, what would you like me to convey to the team? What do you want them to know about you? And depending on your conversation, is there anything you want me to emphasize or anything you'd like me to leave out? And of course we can do that. We can still allude to concepts with broad strokes, but we don't need to convey every tiny specific thing that we've talked about. Instead, we can we could talk about general phrases like family dynamics or existential concerns or you know those kinds of things without compromising the integrity of our relationship that we have. The next slide, please. Oh, and this is from Tim. So Tim, I, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this. You've been using collaborative documentation for a while now. Yeah, we we do it in the VA. This has been open notes for, well, a long time, certainly as long as I've been here, which is uh, just over three years. And so like it was mentioned at the beginning, we have an awareness of, of an increase in who's reading this. Our audience has expanded. So you've got you've got ourselves so we can use this as a reminder if the patient ever comes back uh, or the medical team the interdisciplinary team but also now the patient is the audience and also it it could possibly be even to the family after well depending on the person who's cleared to be able to get access to this so i had this recently in a a completed suicide where I went back in the patient's notes and just reviewed my conversations with this patient and because there was a lot of confusion about how the patient left especially concerning his spirituality there were some in the family who thought that this was was a, a terrible event and there was no hope and that he had lost all faith and I was able to convey because of a in my last conversation with that patient, he was exploring his faith, exploring his belief in God and trying to reconcile his guilt with that. And that for the funeral, actually the uh, person who conducted the funeral was able to include that in their discussion. And uh, it, was a, it was really helpful to the family and to those who were present. So I think in that idea, patient reminded or the notes reminded me and it was also a help to the family after that I'll sit on that side okay you can go to the next one uh so dance like no one is watching but chart like it may be one day be read aloud in a deposition so that if you take any way <laughs> take anything away from this um, I think it's also interesting, so we acknowledge struggles, we affirm strengths, and I think, as Tim mentioned, we need to think about who's accessing the chart. So obviously the patient can, um, but it's not only the patient. Oftentimes, depending on the setting and various kind of technical details about the patient's health and, and permissions, um, the healthcare proxy or other family can access it too. So I think it's interesting to think how, you know, especially in the past year with limited visitor, visitor policies, does that affect family's interest in actually reading the open notes? Are they more likely to read the notes? And I know that for us, um, we, you know, visitor policies seem to change by the week, but we've had patients who are, you know, quite sick. <clears throat> they you know, haven't, you know, maybe aren't giving their family on the phone the big picture of what's going on. And we had a patient whose nephew was definitely reading all the notes and looking in the chart. And when I would, I followed up with him over the phone, he said, oh, you know, my, my aunt was FaceTiming with someone that the doctor wrote that she was FaceTiming. I was, who is she FaceTiming with? You know, this kind of thing. So, um, you know, for better and for worse, I think it can give families a clearer snapshot of what's going on. Um, in terms of obviously the health information and change in prognosis or treatments, but also kind of um, some of the social stuff and maybe even raise some family dynamics that I hadn't, you know, that we hadn't really thought about. And again, um, we'll be following up with a tip sheet that we pulled together and some other information, but for special consideration, mental health concerns, substance use disorder, like sexual behaviors, appearance, decision-making stuff, 
conflict with staff, complaints, those kinds of things as per usual. Hopefully this is sort of already part of our practice, but to be very thoughtful about that. And there are certain terms that we will not use in the chart. We will continue to not use them. Um, and so we need to be judicious and thoughtful in, in the terminology that we use and to have a sense of you know, what's within the scope of our practice, being able to speak in a way that's collaborative, but also to know um, what's outside the boundaries of what we may be documenting. Next Sarah, slide. if I can mention too, that the one thing that you brought up, which is a good point now, if extended family can also view the notes, the patient is able to make changes to who can view them and access them, but that's gonna be something that chaplains are gonna to need to be aware of that process and if family dynamics come in and change some things, that may be something they want to look at. And I think especially, you know, just the idea of communication within families, you know, how much does how much does the patient know? How much does the family know? Who wants to know? Who doesn't want to know? Is, you know, especially like in my, you know, with palliative care patients thinking about that, it's just a really interesting discussion and it's brought up some great discussions within our team about like how how kind of to have a unified voice and how, um, yeah, just to have a clear message and, and really good communication within the small team about um, what we're talking about and what we really want to convey. Thanks. All right, uh, so in a few minutes, I will highlight some considerations for training and development regarding open notes. I hope you'll find this useful both for clinical pastoral education and for uh, staff chat and development. And I will be encouraging you to draw on the strengths you already have as spiritual care practitioners, educators, and leaders uh, to navigate the changes brought about by open notes. So it is a natural reaction of humans to resist change. So acknowledge that resistance as part of this process. Listen to what your own and your team's, team members' resistance has to say for you uh, to hear and consider. Reflect on and verbalize competing commitments a persons may hold, uh, competing priorities as chaplains and health professionals, and other points of tensions you already talked about uh, regarding open notes. And reframe this change and um, probably any other changes as a meaningful opportunity for learning and development for both your chaplaincy team and your CP students. Uh, foster a growth mindset and positive energy about learning and improving our practices and learning to use this new way of engaging patients. Invest in taking advantage of the positive effects of open notes for our chaplaincy profession and practice. And especially if you are a one-person department, uh, but otherwise too, uh, seek out other psychosocial clinicians who are likely to grapple with similar reactions and questions as you uh, regarding open notes. Uh, use this as an opportunity to bond with and learn alongside of them. Uh, while it may challenge your existing spiritual care practices, identify the values of open notes that align with your and your team's values. For instance, open notes promotes values of transparency, autonomy, agency, respect, dignity, uh, trust, and a partnership that's based on reducing power differential between patient and provider. I'm sure these may reflect some of your values that already undergird your spiritual care practice. So lean into those and make it make this as a relational process, interrelational process, uh, which hopefully comes naturally for you as a chaplain. And it is also congruent with the fact that the whole open notes movement centers itself on the provider patient relationship. And the relational process is the container for the rest of my recommendations. It is generally a good idea to match the person's level of proficiency with appropriate supports and challenges, and adjust supports as the person's competencies are increasing toward more autonomous professional practice. As such, scaffolding is often part of CP programs in, one, in some shapes or forms, but may be useful approach for staff chaplains as well. So based on your educational philosophy and on what your electronic medical records uh, allow, you may consider the following options. Uh, you may want to consider having novice or new CP students start by using checkboxes or flow sheets uh, uh, to chart their visits in EMR uh, with no or limited narrative notes, and then help them make progress toward uh, writing narrative open notes. 
whether you start with checkboxes um, or start CPA students writing narrative notes right away, I would recommend the practice of co-signing. Uh, when the student's notes are automatically shared with a co-signer for review and approval. The co-signer can be an educator or a mentor chaplain. Uh, with students and staff, you may consider spot-checking others' notes with regularity uh, or develop a peer feedback process where you check each other's notes to see how they read and give feedback to each other. Uh, which takes me to the next point that any of these approaches are not primarily for approval or disapproval of notes. The main goal is to create an ongoing consultation, feedback, and coaching. Essentially, uh, co-signing or any kind of review of notes should be used as opportunities for coaching. Since direct patient feedback on what we say or write is still scarce, your feedback to your students and to team members is an invaluable gift, especially when it comes to open notes. Uh, for example, during a CP session or a department meeting, you can provide patient care scenarios, have people take a few minutes to write an open note right there and then, and share with each other in small groups for immediate feedback and consultation. Provide the criteria and grid to use to evaluate one's own and others' notes right away. Uh, furthermore, uh, having a non-chaplain give you feedback on your notes can also be priceless. How does my reader hear what I meant to say? There is often a gap between what I mean and what another person gets out of it. And feedback helps to narrow that gap. And of course, clarity of roles, process, and objectives is essential to any of these co-signer, reviewer, coaching, or peer, feed, peer feedback uh, relationships. Also, um, have your CP students include their chaplain chart notes in their verbatims, and also bring a few notes to individual supervision sessions. And also discuss and consult on notes and cases when you meet with your staff uh, individually or as a team. Uh, teach and practice. Uh, how CP students or chaplains would explain open chaplain notes to their patients, as we mentioned, and how to engage in conversation in ways that don't only answer patient questions, but also create opportunities for deeper engagement. It also goes back to learning to introduce ourselves as the chaplain, uh, explaining our role to the patient in accessible terms and in one minute. And so having strong skills in these areas will help the chaplain navigate interactions with patients regarding open notes with more confidence. Finally, I want to highlight the importance of learning the art and the science of spiritual assessment as a foundational skill. While spiritual assessment is not charting and charting is not spiritual assessment, they are interconnected. It is indispensable to have competencies to understand and to have the patient understand their spiritual needs and strengths they bring to the situation. And then we need to develop the complementary set of skills to describe and communicate what is pertinent to the patient's health and coping. This distinction may also be worth considering when you assess the learning needs of your students and your staff. Um, next slide, please. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina Shu. I'm one of the facilitators for the Research Literacy Network. Um, Andrew, next slide. So um, as many of you have pointed out, we do have a couple handouts which we um, were intending to share with everyone. It appears that the first handout which is labeled Guide for Training Chaplains is um, not accessible to most people. Um, so just want to invite everyone to practice being patient with and sitting with a different type of distress, which is technological distress, um, and say that we will be um, making the recording of this uh, webinar available, the PowerPoint will be available, and the handouts will be available later on through tra Transforming Chaplaincy. Um, if you are able to access the second handout, which is labeled Tip Sheet, that one is specifically about open notes. Um, it was developed by Sarah and 
uh, includes a lot of the tips that we've already shared. Um, it also includes um, next slide sample scripts about how to collaborate with your patients um, about the fact that they're you're documenting and how to share that with them. Um, the first handout, which we included, is actually not about open notes, um, but it is about um, just a general guide for ch charting um, and includes some of the issues that we've talked about already, including how to chart sensitively around family conflict, conflict with staff, um, suicidality, um, just some of these difficult things that um, are common to all of our documentation and are often raised, but are not just problems because of open notes. So again, all of the handouts will be available later. Um, next slide. And next one after that. Um, we also wanted to recommend that if you have specific questions related to open notes or the Cures Act, that you can go to the websites. They have lots of resources, especially ones pertaining to specific areas of healthcare, whether that's pediatrics, palliative care, or psychiatry. So you might be operating in a specific context and want to look at the Open Notes website for that um, because we might not be able to cover chaplaincy in all of those different areas. Additionally, um, our network has been doing other webinars related to chaplain documentation, and all of those can be found on the YouTube channel. Similarly, um, many people are also asking about general templates or spiritual assessment tools, um, and we don't have time to cover all of that, so we also recommended um, a link from um, APC that goes over different types of spiritual assessment. Next slide. All right, so um, we are going to open up for a little bit of discussion with our panel just generally about the implications for open notes. Um, and I just wanted to give um, the panel a chance to share. There have been several questions about um, charting about people who are not the patient themselves. Um, what has your experience been with that? And, and this can include both pediatric patients, nonverbal patients, you know, patients sleeping or talking to the family, um, and if there's any guidance about charting about non-patients. If I could mention something about that, I had a, a patient who was uh, detoxing and they asked me to contact their partner and uh, try to, we were trying to get together some uh, counseling for both of them together so they, they could learn to live together in this new sobriety. So we were talking and at a certain point in the process, this patient uh, had a relapse and the partner called me and told me about that. And so I charted something, just a very general uh, conversation about having a conversation with the partner that this patient had uh, reportedly relapsed and uh, would try to get a hold of the patient to verify. Well, the, the patient was distraught because that record was available and they wanted to get it out of their record. They didn't feel like the partner should be part of that charting. And they have a right to request that the record be changed or cleared they have to go through uh, the patient privacy office and, and every hospital is going to be a little different with that i imagine but that was an opportunity actually for me to talk with the patient about what had happened from the time of wanting to be an open book to now saying they didn't want that record listed from the, the conversation possibility of a relapse so it actually started a good conversation and changed their opinion of what they wanted in their notes, but that is something to be aware of, I think, in this process. This is Jeannie. I'm going to jump in. Can you hear me? Yes. My technical difficulties today. Um, so I'm going to encourage anyone who is in pediatrics to go to the Open Notes website because they have a special 
webinar on pediatrics, um, lots of resources because the issues, again, are unique to uh, for that population, especially around adolescents, who gets to read the chart, who doesn't. Certain information is never shared with parents. Um, so I'm gonna encourage for that population you go there. Um, I think we always document about families. We consider the family to be our unit of care. Um, so I think being cognizant of which family member is actually going to have access to the chart um, because the patient grants them that or because they are the legal substitute decision maker um, is important. But I, I can't um, predict we would change our practice um, at all really about documenting how families are. Perhaps we would wanna be less or more careful about how we represent conflicts and some of the family dynamics, right? <laughs> um, so, but again, that's kind of along with those general guidelines um, that I, I hope we've already been implementing in terms of uh, dignified care and respectful charting. That is a question that we talked about as a team putting this together was that idea of, is this going to change the way that we chart or is it just going to make us um, more uh, word specific or, or careful about our vocabulary, how we describe it. And I would say, I don't think it's changed the way that I, I chart from other hospitals I've been a part of, but it has just made me aware that there's somebody else looking over the shoulder, potentially reading this. I would encourage people to think of this as a tool to reinforce their own professionalism in their charting that the, the tools that you have are helping you keep that accountability, that you're writing to the patient cognizant that they're aware of what's going on um, and really promote it to be your professional writing at your best level that you would want to do on every day that some days um, we historically haven't put the energy into that we really need to. Other questions, Christina? Sure. Um, I'll take one more question in this section and then we'll move on to talking about research and then might have a little bit more minutes at the very end for other questions. But thank you to everyone who's submitting questions um, that we might not get to. Um, there's a question about um, the vulnerability about reading about one's own spirituality, especially spiritual struggle um, as a patient and that you know, people might feel very vulnerable to see it represented in the chart that they were scared, discouraged, or experiencing a loss of faith, questioning their faith. So um, I was wondering if anyone would like to respond to that and and kind of um, also the part about how we might acknowledge struggle, but also acknowledge strengths. I mean, I think it's a really important question. And again, I think it's going to be sort of, we're going to refine this as we go, right? The way that we might phrase things. Hopefully, again, as others have mentioned, we wouldn't be doing anything radically different than what we've been doing in the past. Um, I think we can, there's a lot of phrases we can we use that have meaning that can be clear without conveying, you know, a depth of struggle or private you know details um even just saying you know questions about relationship with god or um you know struggles with faith practice or you know there are ways to frame it that show that that it honor and validate like kind of the depth and the importance of that without making a person feel like you've violated you know any kind of special trust um, and again, like I know for me, it's just been a question of kind of keeping, continuing to refine the way I think about it, picturing the patient sitting right there with me. And is this something that I would say in a group in front of the patient to, you know, to my care team with the patient there? If so, then it's probably okay for the chart. And if it's not, then, then it's something that I can allude to clearly and succinctly. You know, we don't want to write paragraphs and paragraphs either. We really want to keep it sort of easy to read easy for any lay person to understand and not use kind of code phrases or sort of like deep existential theological words but instead I think it would be okay to say the patient is sad or experiencing distress or the patient was worried we can use words like that I think that's I think it's accurate and again also to not end with that but to show what we did as our intervention and what the plan is going forward in partnership with the patient and the family Important and that notes, might be right? one of those that might be one of those notes that you want to actually run by the patient. We've talked about a very difficult topic today. Here's my thoughts about how I might represent that to the team and why it's important for the team to know about this. 
um, yeah. that we're working on this, right? Yeah. And I think exactly this is what I wanted to say, to build that relational container for vulnerability and then extend that container into the node as well as there's not they're not supposed to be something new that they didn't face during your visit. Like I wouldn't add things to that, but I speculate that they may be dealing with it by just putting things in the node that actually is clear to the patient as well that they face those vulnerabilities in your conversation. That's a good point because the vulnerability even then would if that goes into the node, that's that's a whole different level of vulnerability to the interdisciplinary team. And so there are times where I'll even suggest to the patient, or at least in the form of a question, when like Jeannie's talking about uh, asking their permission, or is there any part of this that you would like omitted from your notes? That's up to them. I had one patient tell me that he reads the notes. And so I've even used it at times just to briefly review what he shared at his permission. and what he concluded as far as his steps forward because he can use that as a reminder and go back for review uh, thank you let's move forward to the research section next slide next slide please so we have identified already um, lots of opportunities for uh, research on chaplaincy documentation. And let's just be clear today that this webinar is not about how do we document, do we use checkboxes or not. What Open Notes provides us with is this, again, kind of motivation to think deeply into the questions we've already been asking, but with an expanded audience. Um, so I've just summarized here the areas that have been lifted up in our previous um, interactions with our European colleagues and our um, review of uh, research on documentation that we did a little over a year ago. Next slide, please. And as I said, again, now we have the opportunity to think with our chaplain colleagues, once Open Notes has been instituted, the impact this has on our practice. Um, and again, to include our patients um, in addition to what we had hoped to do, which was include our providers and finding out what they actually want us to see documenting. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Paul and Chavo, who are going to talk a little bit more about some of these research questions. Um, and hopefully you all will be um, inspired today to join in some of these efforts, um, because we know that we need to do some evidence. We need to have some evidence about um, this area of our care. Thanks, Jeannie. Hey, with an intro like that, um, so appreciate next it. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul. I'm connected with M Health Fairview up in Minnesota in the upper Midwest. So in the few minutes that we have left, there's no way that we can cover all the points that we'd love to mention, but we definitely want to mention a few, Chaba and I, as we kind of close this out. So the good news is that uh, Open Notes has been a game changer. Um, so that's good news and it's also bad news because we don't have a whole lot of data out there on spiritual assessment. There's a bit of scarcity. So we need to really start with what we call descriptive data. So we have to get a better sense of kind of what's the baseline and where we are at. And a lot of that can be done with things like secondary data analysis where you do this, what they call big data or um, surveys are a great way to mine some of that data as well. I also wanna mention, um, it'd, love, it'd be great to know when the notes are read. Uh, earlier, Sarah talked about a case with somebody FaceTiming and um, is it more likely that somebody would read a note when? Well, that's exactly what this can to get at. We want to measure an association like do patients and families read notes more when it's an end of life situation, when they're in the intensive care unit, when they experience religious struggle that's already been addressed a little bit. And we'd love to know proportion of readers. So, uh, Dr. Phil Choi is one of the few that's out there in the United States data that's actually done some telling of us about how often physicians and or nurses read our notes in the intensive care unit. But otherwise, it's just guessing. So to collect some of that data would be great, especially as it, it gets to that last point there on that slide, that we'd love to start having that data from patients, families, surrogates, legal decision makers. Next slide, please. So the next few slides get into some of the nitty gritty. So let me take a step back. If you're not as familiar with 
researchy language. I just want to mention feasibility and acceptability, but before doing that, I want to invite you to think of your note as an intervention. So if our note is an intervention, we want to begin to think of, is it acceptable to the patient? And if so, how? Same thing being true, if I am providing that intervention or if I am offering that intervention, I want to be able to measure that somehow. The next word that you read at the top of the slide there is pilot studies. Because we don't have data, we need to start at the beginning and that's where we begin to collect data with smaller studies to hopefully get to a bigger study. But on the left hand side of that table are some of the ways that I just put out there to say, you know, we'd love to know is, our, is, is it useful to the patient? Is it useful to the person offering the intervention? Same thing with language and, and also with the ease of reading. So next slide, please. So some of the same language that you'll see present here, um, I'm not gonna cover, of course, all these words. Um, you can do that when you read the slides. As Jeannie had mentioned, right, when she was introducing this research part, we're not advocating that people use more of a flow sheet, more of a narrative progress note. We do wanna recognize, however, that they do exist. And I think they absolutely have to be considered if people are looking at things like what's more acceptable to a patient, the format, the language, and also for the, the usefulness um, as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to my friend Chava here as you kind of wrap up the last slide here. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, so um, some of my research questions, so some of the questions I kind of used uh, post format here are regarding Chapman's because I think we are still scratching the surface on uh, systemically understanding uh, Chapman practices for research, but I would like to take a, take a step back and uh, and one area to explore is the wide spectrum of attitudes and meanings chaplains may hold regarding open notes and its usefulness. So when I'm sure you have had conversation regarding notes as well, and there is a wide spectrum of attitudes and views uh, that chaplains hold. Um, on the one side, some may think it's a chore or having to write notes is a burden or counter to spiritual care. Some may think that, oh, that's just a regular practice of my regular part of my practice or some could even lean into co-writing and co-constructing open notes with patients as a form of spiritual care so again we don't know we do we do know that these attitudes exist uh, but we haven't uh, explored them more systematically uh, and we also uh, need to look at more of the best practices we put it in quotation marks but looking at what the best practices might be for uh, chaplain open notes as well. Uh, uh, we mentioned that our interdisciplinary uh, colleagues are also our readers, but chaplains are also the readers of chaplain notes. So another question could be, how useful do chaplains find other chaplains notes to inform their care? Again, just an open question to consider. And from an educational perspective, uh, how do chaplains learn the language of chaplaincy assessment? the language of chart notes, open notes, and interprofessional communication. Um, and how do we measure these competencies? Again, that has been a, a, a long, uh, a, a, a long-term question in our CP world as well. How do we measure competencies, but how we measure competencies related to chart notes and spiritual assessments as well? And what are the best practices to prepare chaplains for the world of open notes and uh, interprofessional uh, care. So these are some of the examples of the questions I included here, but we really want to encourage you to think about uh, your world, uh, your context, uh, what quality improvement projects uh, that you could do, uh, interviews, focus group surveys, small projects with CPE programs, uh, because we need to start from somewhere and, and that power lies with us in terms of uh, being curious about your questions of practice and, and your research questions, and we encourage you to seek uh, out ways to start answering uh, some of those questions. Thank you, Chaba. Um, so we are at time. We will promise that we will not only make these slides and recording available to everyone, um, but we will answer some of the questions that were left unanswered today. This is just a beginning, right? 
you all need to begin to have these conversations with your own department, both about how you're going to adapt or modify your practice for open notes, but also what research opportunities they are. are. Um, we're hoping that those of you who are not already engaged with the Mighty Network platform might join us there. We could coordinate some of this research, resort, this research. We could replicate studies, we could share experiences and begin to actually um, advance our own <coughs> uh, practice, best practices together. So please um, use that platform, reach out to any of the um, presenters today. I'm gonna ask all of the presenters to put your videos back on. Mm. Thank you everyone for your time, for collaborating. It's certainly been a journey um, and I really appreciate your expertise and sharing of that today. Um, thank you to Transforming Chaplaincy um, and Andrew for making sure that this platform worked. Um, okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks guys, great job, great job. Good start, let's keep it going. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks